Okay, character creation. All you need to do is pick a race and a class, figure out your ability scores, and then pick out some gear. Get with some other people and play. Oh, you want to know my way of doing it? Okay. Welcome to Geek Philosophy, where we explore our love of geeky wisdom. We release new videos weekly, so please consider subscribing and turning on the notifications so you don't miss out on any of the content. If you're new to the channel, my name is Brian, and I would love to give you my take on creating characters for Dungeons & Dragons. This video will be the first in a series about my current character creation process, and I say current because my thoughts about character creation have changed significantly over the years. D&D has evolved, and I've tried to evolve with it while sticking to the things I love most about the hobby. This video serves as a starting point and a foundation for the other videos to come. Since I love examples, I'll walk through the character creation process as we move through these videos. And we'll use a character created specifically for these videos. I think I will name him Ezra Wright, although I may change it if I think of one better. I have to say from the start that there is nothing wrong with the character creation process laid out in the basic rules and the player's handbook. In fact, all of those components are pretty essential. My method just adjusts the order and adds a few things, and it hopefully provides a good foundation for solid role-playing, which is my favorite part of the game. The character prologue describes the character's life and backstory before they started adventuring. And it's not just the background mechanic in 5th edition, although that is included, but it also asks probing questions about who the character really is and where they came from. Just like in real life, there is no shame in leveraging other people's great ideas. But, like in real life, credit should be given where credit is due. And my character prologue is adapted from the Heroic Chronicle section in the Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount, written by the one and only Matt Mercer and Wizards of the Coast. That book is a great resource overall, and even if you're not familiar with Critical Role or Exandria, I highly recommend it. But I think the Heroic Chronicle section in particular is one of the most underrated parts of it for both DMs and players. If you're familiar with the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, many of the options or tables that you'll see throughout this process will be very familiar. And for you DMs out there, you'll see how I used the Heroic Chronicle section as a framework and adapted it for my own campaign. And you can do the same for yours. So if you are a DM, you can introduce the character prologue during your session zero. But if you're a player, you could use the character prologue questions I'll be covering to reveal more about your character and make sure they will fit in with the campaign you're going to join. I advise checking with your DM, though, to make sure that you're on the same page throughout the character creation process. This method is also based on the point of view that your character did not choose some of the most important key aspects of their life. Some of the things like where they were born or who their family were were completely out of their control. Again, the character didn't choose this. You're the player, so you're picking everything or rolling for it in the case. You'll find out about that as we go. The prologue phase of character creation will end right before selecting a character's class. In a way, you can think of it as when that character chooses their profession, but we'll dive into that more in another video. Quick side note, you could also just use this method to create a character for fun. I mean, not necessarily for a specific campaign. And here's a secret, I've made tons of characters that I have never played, just because I like the process and coming up with a character. It's sort of a mini game within D&D without actually playing D&D, and I don't think I'm alone on this, so if you've done this, please let me know in the comments below. Okay, let's start answering some character prologue questions about Ezra. At its basic level, this question is the same as when someone asks you in the real world, where are you from? And even that can be tricky to answer sometimes. If you're traveling to a different country, the answer may be very different than if you're traveling in your own town. In either case though, the answer says something about who you are. It doesn't define everything about you, but it does provide some clues of the basic information about your backstory. This is the same for your character. Depending on the campaign setting, your answer will vary pretty widely. Are you from a far off location or local to the area? Are you from a nation that's currently at war with where the campaign is set? By starting with this question, you'll likely narrow things down quite a bit moving into the other questions. For Ezra Wright, I'm going to go with the random tables I created for my homebrew campaign. I rolled percentile dice earlier and I got a 58. 
So Mr. Wright is from the kingdom of Getica. Okay, this is where we get back to the normal process a little bit. We choose a background, that same background mechanic from the basic rules and player's handbook. And the basic rules and player's handbook refer to it as the beginning of the story, but to me, it's just a part of it. Backgrounds aren't just a description of what the character was doing before they started adventuring. They also have an impact on the game mechanically. They include things like proficiencies and additional languages and equipment. Backgrounds usually have a special feature that's tied to that background's place in society. And suggested characteristics are provided in that background to help you get started on some role-playing elements like personality traits and ideals and bonds for your character. You should read through all the backgrounds and find what works best for you. But for Ezra, I'm gonna roll. And in this case, it's a d20 to find out which background he has. I'm just having fun seeing what randomly pops up, by the way. I got a nine earlier, which means he's a Guild Coalition agent, which is a homebrew background that I created specifically for Ventus. So this should be interesting. Unfortunately, social status is a factor of life. Not something I'm happy about in the real world, but it can make things pretty interesting in D&D. To get the most from the background mechanic, and because they often speak to this issue in a lot of ways, social status is derived directly from those backgrounds. For example, the noble background says something about the character's position, familial wealth, and possible connections in society. The hermit background, on the other hand, as you can imagine, provides social status on the other end of the spectrum. We'll use my version of the social status relationships table that was provided in the Heroic Chronicle. I've adapted that for my campaign world, and each background is associated with social connections that the character has and what the nature of those connections may be. I've adapted this to the factions of my own campaign world. For now, it's just important for me to know what those connections are, and we'll find out more about the allies and rivals later. As a Guild Coalition agent, Ezra has one ally in the Guild Coalition, completely makes sense, by the way, and a rival in the Athenaeum and one rival on the Dallas Tribal Council. Things are starting to get interesting for our Mr. Wright. Okay, so we know Ezra is from the Kingdom of Getica, but that's a big place. So where exactly is he from? Um, let's roll and find out. I rolled an 89 on the percentile dice earlier. By the way, I love rolling percentiles in D&D. For some reason, I think it's because it doesn't happen a whole lot in 5e, and so rolling those two dice is kind of fun. And that roll tells me that Ezra is from Jansen's Crest, which is a town instead of one of the larger cities. So this speaks more detail about Ezra already. How did growing up in a small town affect him? Did he love that type of life, or did he long to visit other places? Maybe he dreamed of moving to the big city one day. Since I'm the DM of my campaign world, I already have information written about Jansen's Crest, so I can read up on the information and kind of remind myself. However, if this information was not available yet, the DM and the player could work together to come up with an appropriate small town for the campaign world. And this makes it very meaningful to the player, by the way. It also helps the DM take a little bit off their shoulders in building out the world. When it comes to character race, players that are already familiar with the game may come in with a pretty solid idea of what they want to choose. But others that are new may not have a clue about what the different options are. With the player and the DM working together, neither of these things should really be a problem. Ventus is a pretty cosmopolitan campaign world, and most of the playable races are found throughout the regions. However, there are some places in Ventus where it's more likely to find certain races due to history and cultural events. As a DM, you might have guessed, I already have a mechanic that lets players roll to find out if their race is from certain areas, but in general, I let them pick whatever they want because that's just fun. For Ezra, I think I'm gonna go with a tiefling. Now it's time to talk about the size of Ezra's family. Family size is tied to the type of home settlement. So if you remember, Jansen's Crest is a town. So I'll use the associated table to roll for his family size. I rolled the percentile dice again, yes, and I got a 34. This means that the right family has two parents and one D4 siblings. I rolled a one on the D4, so Ezra has one sibling and I can decide who that is later. All families have some standout relationships in one way or another. And some families have more than a few. 
So to determine Ezra's powerful relationships within the family, I roll a d3 to figure out how many times I should roll on the family relationship table. Quick note, if you're hunting through your dice right now, trying to find something with three sides, don't worry. Just roll a d6. One to two is a one, three to four is a two, and five to six is a three. If any of this is too complex or just too much for you, skip it. Almost everything here is optional. But I have to say, most of my players find rolling for this stuff really fun. It turns out Ezra has only one powerful relationship. I rolled a 39 on the table and Ezra uncovered a secret about one of his family members. They grew jealous and abandoned him so they could return and go after him one day. Interesting. I can work with my DM to figure out who exactly this family member is and what I found out about them. But either way, this family member now serves as an additional rival for Ezra. And speaking of rivals... A character backstory wouldn't be complete without some allies and rivals. Besides that one family member we just talked about that plans to come back and get revenge on him, Ezra has only one ally and two rivals because of his Guild Coalition background. A roll of 79 on one table tells me that Ezra's friend is a veteran, I rolled a 32 on another table, which gives me their relationship, and turns out they're old drinking buddies. That means that if Ezra needs to, he can stay at his veteran drinking buddy's house whenever he needs to. So he's in town, he needs a place to stay, he can crash with his friend. And so can Ezra's companions. Pretty cool. I also have two rivals. For the first, I rolled a 9 on one table and a 7 on the other, and it turns out that there is an acolyte of some kind that believes Ezra killed their sibling, and they're now out for blood. For the second rival, I rolled again. This turns out to be a noble that Ezra broke a promise to, and that person is conspiring to get back at Ezra by getting someone else to break a promise to Ezra. What? By the way, the last option that I just went through on the table, it also gave Ezra a fateful moment. Sometimes the stars align and fateful moments occur. And these are large story points that made a significant impact on the character. Now, not every character needs one of these fateful moments or a turning point of some kind in their prologue. And it's fine to skip this altogether, but since I rolled the dice and the table told me so, I'm gonna figure out what this is. Let's do it. This table called for a d20 roll and I rolled a 19. And so that means while reading through a mysterious tome owned by his parents, Ezra found a treasure map to some place in the Austin Reach. And the Austin Reach is a largely unknown and underexplored area on the continent. Interesting. The specific location is really up to the DM and it would be a great hook to bring the characters together for some reason if someone else is also searching for that place. It's good stuff. What are a few of your favorite things? Well, we can go as detailed as we like when it comes to fleshing out Ezra's favorites, or we can keep it simple. Just like the Heroic Chronicle in the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, I have a list of favorite foods by region of my own campaign world. So that is usually a good starting point to spark the imagination for other things. Noting specific favorites can be a great way to put you in a role-playing mindset, so have fun with this. By the way, I rolled a four. So Ezra really likes fried potato slices with diced bacon. But then, who, who doesn't? Okay, that's character prologue. From here, we'll jump into selecting a class, but that will be a video all in itself. And I hope you've enjoyed going through this process with me and found a couple of things worth implementing in your next character. With all this talk about background and characters and history and all of that kind of stuff, it got me thinking about one of the greatest character creators of all time. So, as the late great Stan Lee once said, being a geek has become a badge of honor.